I had this moment of panic. I made a list this morning for chores I was going to do this weekend, and I reached into my pocket. Huh. Okay. Um, I, I want to take a moment, by the way, we're, we're all wearing these, and uh, Serena, Serena, who is really the principal organizing the events today, we could give her a hand. <laughs> wonderful. But Serena's very thoughtful in details. I don't know, maybe this was Carrie's idea. They printed the first name really big, which is not only easy to read for others, but for those of us that get nervous easily, you can remember who you are by just glancing at it. So I find that very helpful. Very helpful. Um, so I'm going to introduce a uh, keynote speaker here today in two parts. So here's the first part. Steve Conine, is the co-founder and co-chairman of Wayfair, the largest online retailer of home furnishings and housewares in the United States. Prior to co-founding Wayfair, Steve co-founded Spinners Incorporated, an IT service firm. Spinners provided custom application development services to Fortune 500 companies, including AOL, Time Warner, The New York Times, J.P. Morgan Chase, and Merrill Lynch. And Steve was integral to the development of all technology solutions that Spinners created. Steve's an incredibly uh, innovative guy, and we'll get to that more in a minute. He led Spinners to revenue and net income growth of 300% per year while maintaining a 30% net income margin. In 1998, Spinners was sold to IXL, a publicly traded global technology consulting firm, and Steve went on to serve as Chief Operating Officer for IXL in the London office, where he was responsible for sales, del service delivery, and operations in the UK market. And after moving on from Spinners and IXL, Steve was founder, Chief Technology Officer, and board member of Simplify Mobile, a software company providing mobile phone management solutions to large enterprises. And this was the third startup that Steve founded with Niraj Shah before starting Wayfair together. I think Steve gets bored easily, just to guess. Simplify Mobile was sold to Tango, a telecommunications software company. Part two. Beautiful, beautiful fall day. Bob Allen and I rode the Sleep Valley gravel grinder a 50-mile bicycle race on area dirt roads started and ended at Green Mountain College. Now, Bob and I aren't competitive racers, but the race honors Kellen Sams, a GMC alum who was killed in an avalanche and raises money for a scholarship in his name. So we rode. And while we were riding, we met this most delightful couple, Alexi and Steve. And they were kind enough to ride with us for a few miles. As we chatted, I learned that Steve has been coming to Pulteney for more than 30 years as his family owns a home on Lake St. Catherine. And that recently, Steve and Alexi had bought over 400 acres in Pulteney across from the college's Dean Preserve. And there they built miles of world-class mountain biking trails and opened them to public use. And I was thrilled to finally meet these generous souls and civic-minded neighbors. As first conversations do, we got to the, so what do you do for work question. Steve mentioned something about running a company called Wayfair. Now, I'm not much of a shopper, and the name didn't mean anything to me. And we rather rapidly moved on to talk about Pulteney and their land and riding in the college and their three children. And afterwards, I uh, had a delightful beer with Alexi and Steve after the ride. I went home and I, I said, oh, it's a fascinating, great people. So I Googled Steve. And yeah, 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 the Wayfair stuff is pretty interesting. But what really caught my eye was his ice sculpture and the incredible devices he has made in the cool house in Wyoming with the living roof, the solar panels, and get this, the indoor slide from the second floor. <laughs> um, so it's my pleasure today 
to introduce to you the Steve half of Alexei and Steve Conine, a generous neighbor and proud father with a passion for cycling and a creative bent who enjoys working with hand and mind to make the world a better place. And yes, he's also a serial entrepreneur whose most recent project is Wayfair, the online home furnishing retailer. Please join me in welcoming our friend and neighbor, Steve Conine. Wow, well that, that, was, that, was a very nice, uh, that was a very nice intro. Um, I'm very happy to be here. It was, uh, it was amazing to run into to Bob and Tom on that bike ride. I've been coming up to Poultney for 30 years, as, as Tom mentioned, and um, as I've gotten older, I've tried to get more involved up here. Um, and, and as Tom mentioned, we just opened a really amazing trail system, so any, anyone in the college who likes biking or hiking should check it out. Um, you, you know, I was, I was, as I was coming up here, and, and uh, I was trying to figure out, you know, how do I boil down like 20 years of my entrepreneurial life to a few tidbits that are useful to maybe some of you guys uh, in the audience? And then, and then I was also thinking, you know, most audience I t I, audiences I talk to nowadays of this size, I'm, I'm paying most of them to be there. So hopefully you guys are as friendly as them. Um, Wayfair today is, is a big company. It's, uh, it's, we're about 6,000 people. Uh, we're a publicly traded uh, business. We trade under the ticker, ticker symbol W. Um, and last year we did about uh, three and a half billion dollars in total revenue, which is 50% of over the year before. So as an entrepreneur, you know, it's like I'm living the dream, and it's been very interesting to kind of to kind of go along the road to get to where I've gotten to uh, as an entrepreneur. Um, it wasn't it wasn't always as glamorous as it is today. And, and rather than kind of you know talk to you guys about how, what we've done at Wayfair and all that, we do a lot of great things. We have a, we have a great culture and a great team there. I thought maybe what would be more interesting was tr to try to kind of um, fill in the gaps on. Um, my sort of career as an entrepreneur. I started as an entrepreneur um, in a very similar situation to a lot of the students in the audience today. I, I had gone to Cornell uh, University and I was an undergrad there. I studied mechanical engineering. Um, I'd always like working for myself, but I like this right Chuck told her. And I was a kid, I used to think these little wooden reindeer and try to sell them to local neighbors and stuff. Um, and you know, I always liked being an entrepreneur. And, and, and I remember my father occasionally would motivate me. I, I was always a socially responsible kid, and I'd be complaining about this or that. He'd be like, Steve, you know, the thing is, you can either be the guy on the soapbox in the corner, or you could be Bill Gates. And like, who do you think had more influence? And I'd be like, oh, damn it, you keep trying to keep kind of right. Yeah, I better do something. Like that. So, um, so my last semester at Cornell, I took an entrepreneurship class, and um, in the class, you had to, to create a business plan. And uh, '95 was was the year I graduated college, which was the year the Netscape browser came out. Um, so it was the very early years of the internet. And that, that class, uh, my friends and I who were taking the class together spent a lot of time trying to brainstorm about, geez, this internet thing seems really cool, what are, what are business opportunities we, we might be able to, to come up with? And you know, we missed, uh, we missed picking Facebook, we didn't create Google, we thought you know, we missed Snapchat as a, as a thing. Um, and we ended up deciding that a good business would be uh, building websites for companies. Um, which uh, is a very, it's a very simple business, right? People, people at the time uh, didn't know how to build websites. We kind of figured it out. So we would go down to New York and pitch local businesses on, hey, you know, would you guys be willing to buy a website? And it took a lot of rejection. You know, you can imagine going down Main Street of Poultney and trying to sell websites. Like, you know, you know get everyone to say yes to you. Um, but occasionally someone would say, yeah, they'd be like, yeah, you know, I heard about the internet. And I'm kind of curious to try it. And, and, and sure, I'd love to, uh, I'd love to have you guys build a website for me. So um, through that semester, we, we started building websites and started kind of working on it. And Nirj and I both were interviewing at, at regular companies because, you know, we thought we'd just get a traditional career. I, I was a mechanical engineer. I figured I'd go work for GM or Ford, and I'd interviewed at a bunch of those places. And, um, and by the time we graduated, though, you know, we had this little portfolio of, of customers that we'd been working for. And we thought, geez, this has been kind of fun. We ought to, we ought to give it through the summer and sort of see what we can do with it. And so that summer, uh, we moved to Boston. Uh, which I guess, you know, if you're, if you're thinking New York and you want to go to the big city, then Boston's a good location. Um, and so we moved to Boston and, and, and sort of ramped it up and worked hard at it that summer. And, and by the end of the summer, we had a pretty nice portfolio of customers and we were getting more work uh, than we could do ourselves. And so we sort of said, you know, this is, this is great. Like, we should really probably just do this. Um, and and we, were, we had enough work that we could then, we could see, like, okay, we could probably start to hire people. Now, we were a couple of college kids. And, you know, the, the beauty of being, one of the things I'll tell you, being an entrepreneur, if you're, gonna, if you're interested in it at all, the younger you start when you do it, the younger you can start when you, when you give it a try, the better off you are. 
Um, we've had a bunch of failures in our career, and the more times you kind of get to run around the track and try again, uh, the more likelihood you'll have of getting it right. Um, well, so, so, so that summer, uh, you know, by the end of the year, we were kind of like, okay, let's do this. We, we also didn't have a lot of money. We were a couple of college kids. We were living in this ratty apartment right across from the entrance of Mass General. The ambulances used to go by all the time. Like, customers would ask us if we were calling them from a payphone. You know, <laughs> Mass General. And, uh, and so, you know, it, it, and so, so we said, okay, great, let's, let's do it. How are we going to, you know, how are we going to fund it? How are we going to get it going? Well, it turns out that, you know, a, a professional services business is the kind of business you can start with, with very little funding. And, you know, it's interesting. The three businesses I've started have all been bootstrapped. And I think there's a little bit of a notion, or at least when I was a kid, I had the notion of being an entrepreneur requires a lot of money, requires investment, requires fundraising. It turns out that most entrepreneurs in the world who go into business for themselves do something that's probably just an incremental improvement off of an existing business or is an existing business. Um, you know, I, I have friends who are bankers and lawyers or who are you know, running retail businesses, running restaurants. Those are all businesses you can go into. And a lot of times with your own resourcefulness and scrappiness and you know, innovation, you can, you can make a go of it. And so this first business we started, <clears throat> um, you know, we, we were able to get it going through our own scrappiness and resourcefulness, basically building our time, building our scale out to customers, scaling the thing up, <clears throat> eventually getting where we could hire people. Now when you start hiring people, there's another decision point you gotta go through. And I remember having arguments with my business partner about this because you're gonna get to the point where you, 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 you're paying yourselves a little bit and you feel like you're, being, you're getting to be successful. If you hire someone, you're basically going to get to the point where you probably can't pay yourself anymore. You have to pay them instead. And so, um, and so that was an interesting transition that we kind of went through. And you know, the way I would describe it is I think if you're, if you're going to be an entrepreneur, one thing you should think a little bit about is do you want to do it because you like the lifestyle or do you want to do it because you're trying to build equity value in the business and you're going to do something else down the road? Probably not it, right? If you're going to build a lifestyle business, that's, that's great. I have relatives who are farmers in upstate New York, and they, you know, they're entrepreneurs, they run a farm, they love it, it's a great lifestyle, it provides some nice income for them, provides obviously you know, food and all. I have other, you know, other friends who are bankers or lawyers or who run restaurants, and again, you know, they're probably planning on doing it for a very, very long time. They're not really looking to kind of like build it and then sell it and go do something else. The first business we started, we very intentionally sort of made a decision to say, we're going to build this thing to create equity value, to sell it, to try to then go do something else. Um, and, so, uh, and so those are kind of two, two points I, I, I was trying to The last thing I'll tell you in this first business was if you start a business, um, you know, you're probably going to have business partners, <laughs> or at least we did. You don't, you don't have to. If you have business partners, the transition from being friends in college to being partners in business is a very difficult transition. And I probably can't give you much in the way of advice in, in just a few minutes up here, but um, the one thing I will tell you is that you need to learn how to take critical feedback. And you know, when you go from being friends uh, to being business partners, and all of a sudden your financial well-being is on the line with this other person, their faults and the things that they could do better to make you more successful stand out blatantly. And you can't resist telling them. <laughs> and you know, it goes both ways. And I remember I used to get so mad at my, my friend Neeraj when he would tell me, like, you gotta do that differently, or you know, you just gotta learn how to do this, or you gotta work harder. It really pissed me off, and I'd be like, geez, I'd be telling him the same thing. Well, after, over the course of a, of a year or so working together, I think we both matured a lot. And then, you, you know, really, really, as the, at this point, I've been working with this guy for 25 years. But um, you really get to the point where you start to say, look, I, he's doing it because he wants to be successful. He's trying to make us both successful, and he's make, trying to make me better. And, you, you, you know, if you can get over that mental hurdle of kind of the, the, the fight uh, reaction you have when you get negative feedback a lot of times, it, it really will, will further you along in, in your career with working with whoever you're working with. Um, all right, I'll jump to the next business, which is Simplify Mobile. This was our failed startup. Um, I'm, I, in my bio, it doesn't sound quite so much like a failed startup, but, but we, we started this business in the mobile phone space, thinking the mobile phone business was this exciting space to be in. Um, we had just come off this business, Spinners, which I kind of skipped over, but it was the two of us starting it. We grew to about 40 people. We sold it to a company called IXL. IXL went public in 99. It was the internet heyday years. IXL's stock offering was very successful. They ran up to maybe a $50 stock price, which gave it a market cap that I think was bigger than Ford or GM or some such thing. Ridiculous when you think back on it, but we were all lost in the hype and thought the thing was going to the moon. Um, we got to then see the stock go from $50 to $5 to $0.50 cents to a nickel to basically out of business over the course of a, of, of a very short period of time. And as young individuals got to see what was a life-changing amount of wealth, so tens of millions of dollars basically go back down to zero. Um, and it was, that was another you know, impactful experience to have gone through as a, as a young person where you, you sort of realize that you know, 
what you do in life, you're doing because you enjoy it and you need to love it. Um, you know, you, your working life is the majority of your waking hours, and so you better do something that you enjoy, that you love, and you feel is meaning, your, is meaning has meaning in your life. Um, and don't just do it because you're trying to whatever you know get rich quick. Um, so we, we got into this next business, Simplify Mobile. We, we, we thought the mobile phone space was going to be hot. We plugged away at this business for a year. I spent the better part of a year sitting in a phone book, cold calling companies, uh, just you know working, trying to figure out if I could find a pitch that would work on them. And it was all kind of around trying to help them save money on their mobile phones or how to optimize their mobile phone billing. And it turned out to be a small market, and I just I couldn't sell. And the one story I remember from that business that I thought I'd share with you is my dad would, would try to motivate me when we were going through kind of these dark years going on this cold call, he'd say, hey Steve, when you go to do cold calling every day, set yourself a goal. Like, you're gonna, do, you're gonna get 30 rejections. And he's like, if you think about it that way, he's like, every rejection you get, you're one step closer to leaving that day. <laughs> and he's like, that way, it's a good thing. You'll be psyched to get a rejection, because you'll want to, you know? I was like, okay, that's a really good way to look at that, right? So there's little tricks that we, that you know, like that, that I, I think, you know, you'll pick up in your career that, that will motivate you and value life. Um, the last business that I started was, was Wafer. So we, we shuttered this business in 2002, and um, we actually sold the software, which it says when I buy it, to a company in New Haven, Connecticut, for $30,000. So a year's worth of work, two of us, $30,000, you know, we each got 15 grand. Um, would have been better off doing a lot of things that year rather than doing what, what we had done. But, but we learned a lot about, you know, taking failure together. We're now at the low point of our career as entrepreneurs, and we both were sort of like, oh, we better just go get a job. And I remember we interviewed around. At this point, I'm married, and I'm, my wife is supporting the two of us. We're both living in this apartment we have in the city. Uh, Nearest doesn't pay rent. He's, he's actually, uh, he gives us free groceries, so that's kind of his rent instead. So um, and my wife's kind of, I think, thinking like, what, you know, what the heck is going on? This? So, uh, so we start brainstorming new ideas for businesses, because we could tell we didn't want to go get a job. Um, and, or nobody would hire us. I think we were just so entrepreneurial that, that we couldn't find anything that could fit. Anyway, um, we eventually uh, we, we, we eventually got really excited about e-commerce. And in 2002, there were a lot of small e-commerce operators around that were having quite nice success. A lot of them had started in the late 90s. You know, a lot of them had that mentality of they wanted to get rich quick. They started this business. This, it was the golden years of the internet. And the internet bubble had burst, and they were left with these businesses that a lot of them they were growing very nicely. Um, but they just didn't have you know, any sort of exit strategy or any, they didn't really know where they were going. Um, and, and, and so it gave us the inkling that, geez, you know, there's a real market here, there's people who want to buy this stuff. Um, and we thought initially that maybe we'd go buy a whole bunch of these little small operators and bring them together into a portfolio of conglomerate kind of e-commerce businesses. Um, but our nature was to bootstrap, and we really had never raised money. We'd always just done our businesses off the resourcefulness and the scrappiness of ourselves. Um, and so we, we really didn't like the idea of, of going out and trying to raise money. So, we sort of said, look, the way to do it instead would probably be to just pick a category and try to start a site. Um, start small, <laughs> if that one works, pick another category, and just try to build our own portfolio of, of e-commerce properties. And so the first category we picked was uh, <clears throat> speaker stands, which is these little stands you can speakers on. So now my wife's probably thinking, like, okay, great, this guy's a mechanic like Jim Cornell. You know, I thought he was going to be successful, blah, blah, blah. And now his partner's living with me, and he's selling speaker stands on the internet. <laughs> so, <laughs> my parents, I think, were like, oh. But uh, anyway, the speaker stand, you know, the speaker stands, they sold. And we, we ended up picking a good category. We got customers to start talking to us. And we got momentum. And the, the, so the thing I, I guess I, I will leave you with as an entrepreneur, and obviously, you know, that, those businesses, we did start all these microsites, and they, they eventually turned into Wayfair, and there's a whole story around that. You can Google it and find a whole, all kinds of talk we've done on that. Um, the thing I'll leave you with, though, is, is as an entrepreneur, there's this thing, Nears and I always refer to as momentum. And so, you know, if you can get yourself pointed in a direction, and you can get people paying you to do something, hopefully something you like doing, that momentum will lead you down a path that you can then start to blossom things off of. And you'll see opportunities, and you'll figure out how to make it a little bit better the next day, and figure out how to do it a little bit different, figure out how to be a little bit more innovative. And over the time, over time, that will compound, and you can end up in the situation where I find myself today, where you're running you know, a, a very large publicly traded company and, and you've influenced the lives of thousands of people. So, um, so hopefully, whatever, just some tidbits that you guys find useful. Um, I guess with that, we're going to switch over to questions.